Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Lord, we thank you for this Easter morning. We thank you for the empty tomb and, and all that uh, you've done for us to pay for our sins. And Lord, we just pray now that in one spirit, Lord, you'd fill us all with the Holy Spirit. We pray that you use Pastor Izzy as a vessel to speak through today to encourage us, to meet us where we're at, Lord, and to, uh, to show us who you are and reveal yourself more, more deeply. We ask that now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, guys, this is the most f funnest time of year for me to preach because um, you really can't go wrong when you're talking about the Resurrection Sunday message. I mean, this is the day we celebrate the Lord rising from the dead. L last night on my Facebook, there was a post about um, two bunnies sitting there, and one bunny was asking the other bunny, what do we have to do with Christ's resurrection? And the other bunny answered, I'm still trying to get over that we lay eggs. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I told one of the kids that today, and they didn't know that bunnies give live birth to bunnies. They don't lay eggs. <laughs> so that's the, I mean... If you grew up on a farm, you think, that whole Easter egg thing is stupid. You know, bunnies don't lay eggs. I mean, who came up with it? You know, and people think we're stupid for believing in Jesus. That, no, really, they think that we're the one following a fable. I'm like, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but you might want to check your sources. It's the things we're going to go over this morning, these were things today is, this is a, one of the, hopefully this will be a great boost to your faith. This is we're going to take a look at the gospel accounts of Christ's resurrection. But before I go to the resurrection, I have to refer back to the, to the day when they took him down from the cross. As, uh, we refer to it in, in American culture as Good Friday. I, I always wonder what was so good about it. It wasn't good for Jesus. I mean, it was good for us, right? Because Christ died for us. That's why it's called Good Friday, by the way. Not because it was so good for Jesus. In fact, Jesus said, Father, if, if it be all right with you, let this um, cup do what? Pass from me. I don't want to drink it. But he knew that in order to save us, he was going to have to take of this cup. He was going to have to take upon himself. It says the sacrifice of that perfect lamb, the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, he would have to take all of the sins upon himself. He who knew no sin, the Bible says, became sin for us. In other words, he took on himself all of our sins. And Christ said, no, one, no man takes my life. I give it freely. I, I lay it down. And so Christ died. And, and, and I want you to start this morning with just looking at a quick uh, uh, part of that, of him giving up his spirit. In Matthew chapter 27, it says, Then Jesus, in verse 50, cried out again with a loud voice, and he yielded up his spirit. Now, if we had time, I'd take you to the other gospel accounts. It says he the last thing he cried out was, it is what? Finished. He had finished the sacrifice for our sins. And it says here in Matthew's gospel, after he cried this out with a loud voice, he yielded up his spirit. He, he chose when he was going to go. He went, okay, I'm done. It's finished. Finished the job, the task I was sent to do to die for their sins, I, uh, uh, to be the sacrifice, the lamb that would take away the sins of the world. I have fulfilled it. It is finished. Then, when he yielded up his spirit, Matthew tells us a few details that the other gospel writers don't include. And I, I have to point them out today because it'll help bring the story to life when we go to look at the resurrection. It says here in, in verse uh, 51 of Matthew 27, Behold then, the veil of the temple was torn in two from the, from the what? The top? To the bottom, not from the bottom to the top. There's a significance to this, by the way. In, in Jewish culture, from the top to the bottom was indicating who's doing the tearing, man or God. See, from the top being torn open to the bottom was saying God has tore the veil. Now, this was the veil that, that resided between the Holy of Holies and the, and the tabernacle, that this would be the one that would let you go into the presence. Only once a year was a priest allowed to go into that holy of holies where the ark was kept in the back of the tabernacle. 
And that veil, when Christ yielded up his spirit, that veil was torn. And that was a, that was a, a what, what would the Jews call it? They, they like all these types and, and, and um, shadows, symbol, the, 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 the symbolism behind these things. Who was tearing the veil? Well, Christ is saying that this veil, this, this thing what is separated man from coming into God's presence, Christ has now tore it. He's tore it from the top down and made the way into God's presence. This is a pretty big deal. You know, the thing that kept men from getting to God is now it's been it's been removed. And that says and also now why don't they put they did do in one of the movies I saw Hollywood did include the earth. It says shook. But it says here and the rocks split. They were just fracturing. What I think we need to do a remake on these Hollywood shows. You know, I could put in a few extra details that the book has. That for some reason these guys making up the Jesus movies, they don't read the, they don't read the script. Y- you ever heard? Sometimes you watch a movie and you're like, man, the book was so much better than the movie. It's a big disappointment. That's how I feel when I watch a lot of these the religious movies. I'm like, somebody didn't read the book, because here's one I want to read you this morning. Now, Matthew tells us this. Also, he says, and the tombs were open. And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep, that's the old way of saying had what? Died. They were raised. Coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Has anyone ever seen that included in a Hollywood movie? That after Christ rose from the dead, he wasn't the only one seen risen from the dead. Right here in the Gospel of Matthew, you guys, you, you can highlight that if you want. You can see, in case you happen to have rub elbows with anyone in Hollywood, I want you to tell them to, you know, do an extra deleted scene or something, stick this into the movie. That, that not only did Jesus rise, he, it says he was the firstborn of the resurrection, right? He was the first. Ephesians tells us that before he ascended, he first descended and preached release to the captives and said, who wants to get out of here? And now... Matthew tells us after Christ's resurrection, there was this other little detail. Now, why don't they put this in the movie? Don't you think, like, couldn't we do a little bit of like a, like little, you know how they do those little vignettes of the storyline where, you know, over here's Auntie May and she's over there and, and, and then she gets sick and she dies and, and it's a couple days before Christ goes to the cross, you know, and, and, and then you have the, the grandma over there, she, she died and, and all the people were mourning and they went to her funeral and they buried her and she's in the graveyard just next to Golgotha, you know, over there by where they're going to crucify you. You could tie it all in, right? And then, you know, have them, and then after Christ rises from the dead, you have the grandma reappearing at the door, knocking on the door. Honey, open the door. I'm, and, the, and, the, and, the little, and the little grandchild going, Grandma, Nina, I missed you, you know. And, and she said, it's okay, Jesus, Jesus rose us from the dead. I mean, do you think that would powerfully reiterate this whole thing, what we study about our Lord. I mean, will Christ raise us from the dead? Yeah. I mean, we're, we're, well, actually, Paul said that the ones that had died before Christ had come, they were the ones waiting for that resurrection. He was the firstborn of the resurrection. Then they were risen. Now, Paul writes to us in Corinthians. He says, now, don't you guys know now that we don't have to go to this place, Abraham's bosom, and wait? Because he says, the, that the door has been opened. And who was the door? Jesus said it. He said, I'm the door. You want to get in? Anyone want to get to the Father? He says, I am the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No one gets the Father but through me. But after he died, he made the way that the door is open. And And Paul, the apostle, tells us that now, if we die as a believer, we're absent from this body and we're present where? In Abraham's bosom, right? No. In... Purgatory, right? No. You know, some of these guys come up with stuff. I'm like, you need to read the book. This book. This book says that when you are absent from the body as a believer, when your spirit leaves this little shelly thing that you're living in, which Paul refers to as a tent, by the way, just like we're just camping out in here. You, 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 never, you ever looked in the mirror and went, 
you see that reflection like I'm much better looking on the inside. Just something's not agreeing with what I'm seeing. You know, your tent doesn't quite line up with how you feel. That spirit within you, that part of you that makes you who you are. You're like. But see, Paul says that when you're absent from this body, when your spirit leaves this body as a believer, you will go to be present with the Lord. And this what is mortal will be swallowed up by immortality. The corruptible will be swallowed up by what? Incorruption. You're going to be made into a new creature that is eternal in the heavens. The Bible says you will have no more sorrow, no more pain. Anyone up for this, by the way? Trading in the pain of these body, these tents. They come with creaks, don't they? A little, sometimes, like, you know, the little zipper on the front is stuck. And it's like, you know, <coughs> and you're like, there's a problem with this tent. It doesn't work so good anymore. I'm ready to trade in for, you know what, Paul? By the way, Paul likens this body, this earthly body. He has a term for it. This is the tent. Our heavenly body has a different term. Does anyone know what he uses in 2 Corinthians for our heavenly body? So it's a, it's a kind of really, he's good with word pictures. You, you heard that term, right? Word picture. W what does he call our heavenly body? A mansion. Anyone up for an upgrade? Let's go. Anyone in? You, we're going to trade in this tent for a mansion. I love the way that he picks these things to describe what God is going to do for us. We get to upgrade to a mansion. Now, just to let you know, this is the, this is the hope of our faith that we have. The Lord has, he has done great things to make sure. Jesus said, I go to my father's house. In my father's house are many what? mansions if it were not so he said i would not tell you now i know a lot of people when they read that verse they're thinking mansion as in you know ginormous house somewhere but i always wonder what if it's what paul's talking about that mansion what is he's referring to you dwell in this little tent right now wait till you see what you get when you're before the lord i mean you get he refers to that paul does as a mansion that's an upgrade. You're, you're not, you're not going to have any more pain, no more squeaky joints and popping knees for me, no more hurting. You know, it's going to be glorious. This is what we look forward to. Now, Matthew includes that Christ, when he died and rose, that after his resurrection, all these saints that were waiting because, well, the kids asked me, how come those guys that died waiting for the promise of the Messiah. How come they didn't get to go to heaven? I told him, it's like, um, well, Jesus said in Luke 17, it's like the, the, the rich man when he died and he went to, to Hades. But there was a poor man, L Lazarus, that was begging for the crumbs outside by his gate. And he had even sores that the dogs were licking his sores. And, and he, he died, it says, and the angels carried him away to Abraham's bosom where he waited. Now, I, by the way, I think Lazarus is one of the guys you're going to, maybe they could have thrown him in on the whole, re, you know, resurrection thing, show him back. In. That would be a nice vignette. You know, you could just slide that into the story. And old Lazarus comes back, visiting the gate where the rich man was. He, the rich man, I'm not sure the rich man ri rose in, the, in this resurrection, what we're reading about, but, but I'm sure Lazarus did. And he could have come back and fed the dog that licked his sores and, you know, they could have, like, made a really cool little scene. I, give it to Spielberg. He'd do something nice with it. You know, he can make a really nice, point out these things that, that the Bible tells us took place. Now, how many of you believe that Christ really rose from the dead? Because if you don't, you're going to think the rest of the story is foolish. Okay? Because the truth of this is, is based on one thing. We have eyewitnesses of Christ resurrected. It's not a fable. It's not like bunnies laying eggs. We have the real personage of Christ who was put to death on that cross. And three days later, we're going to see this morning, we're going to turn to John's gospel. If you turn with me right now to John, well, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to read you one more thing from Matthew. It said, um, now in verse 54, the centurion who was there with him, keeping guard over Jesus, when he saw the earthquake and the things that happened, this is while Jesus is up on the cross, he became frightened. A centurion, a, fi a soldier, trained, we'd say like Green Beret, is freaked out. And he said, by watching Jesus, how he had, now these men had seen people die.
But he said of Jesus, truly this man was the son of God. In the way that he died, there's no, this is not the death of an ordinary man. This man truly was the son of God. And many women, it says, were there looking on from a distance, the ones who had followed Jesus from Galilee while ministering to him. Now, among them was Mary Magdalene, and there was Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. It says, and, and when it was evening, there was a rich man that came from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself, it says, had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man, he went to, to Pilate. He asked for the body of Jesus, and then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean cloth, laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. And Mary Magdalene, who was there, and the other Mary sitting opposite the grave. Now this, it says, was on the day, the next day, it says, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, he said that after three days, I am going to what? Rise again. So, um... Give orders that they make the grave secure. Otherwise, his disciples might come and steal away his body and say to the people, he has risen from the dead. And the last deception, they said, would be worse than the first. So Pilate said, go, you have your guard, make it as secure as you know how. So they went and secured the grave. They set the seal on the stone. You guys know that part, right? They, they put Roman seal on it. Anyone who breaks, if you broke a Roman seal, what was the punishment? Death. So... It's like the Romans stepped in, all right, we stamp this, leave it, everyone, hands off, guard is guarding it. And you guys know the story, what happens. But, but three days later, what will happen? The guard is going to, um, well, it says they're going to go down to their faces and they're going to be extremely frightened because there's going to be an occurrence. The stone will be rolled away. By the way, let me jump to John's Gospel to get to the part of the Resurrection Sunday that we're celebrating today. In John's Gospel, in chapter 20, on the first day of the week, which we call Sunday, if you look on your calendar, it starts Sunday, then Monday. I know some of you think Monday is the first day of the week. No, it's not. Sunday is the first day. And on the first day of the week, it says, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark. See, they were not allowed to do work on the Sabbath. And this is when Christ died the day before, what's called the day of preparation. They had to get prepared for the Sabbath. And as soon as so, uh, the, some of the kids were asking me this, I don't get it. How come they're like in a hurry? It's like almost sunset and they're trying to get Jesus' body off the, off the cross and get it to the grave. And Joseph, he was a wealthy man. He had actually prepared his own grave. Carved. I've been to, to, to Jerusalem. There's a place called the Garden Tomb. And it fits this, this um, description of the scripture. These guys, they, it, it's a beautiful garden, but it's kind of set in a, a stone area where, the, where the, just the contour of, the, of this rock formation, it forms a natural wall all the way around like about two-thirds of a, a half circle. And it right car Joseph had carved right into the stone his own grave. He a doorway, walk in, and there's a, there's a bed carved right into the stone to lay the body to rest. And it's very similar. It has a, a trough carved into the stone for a large, like, six-foot-high stone about, uh, about uh, more than a foot thick. It's a big, monster, round stone that is rolled down the trough. Now, when I was there, I'm, I studied architecture, so I, I'm a geek. I took my water bottle and poured a little water into the trough. Do you know why I did that? What does water do? Always seeks the lowest spot, right? So I was trying to figure out how did it, you know, in the preparation of this whole thing, because I noticed that right in front of the doorway, the, the trough is a little bit lower. And it's like kind of dipped like a round, you know, to accept the round stone as it falls into that, it like locks it into place. But if you come back way over here, like six feet away, and pour the water there, you'll see that the water will slowly trickle down the trough all the way to the, to the dip. So rolling the stone down, you know, this big six-foot-high, foot-thick stone that weighs hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Well, you know, still, how, mu how much would it be a, 
It's about that thick and I mean, it's as high as a man. The thing's like this big around. And they rolled it down into place. The rolling down doesn't seem that hard. It would be once it fell into the slot, how do you get that thing out? You know, this, we're talking, you know, it's, I, I, I just had to be conservative and say at least, at least 500 pounds, maybe 1,000 pounds of rock has been rolled over the... And Mary... You know, on the day before the, the Sabbath begins, the Jews, by the way, they count their Sabbath, their day starts at sunset. They go night, then morning, then noon, back to night. Wh- as soon as the sun sets again, that's one day. You read Genesis. God c- created the earth, right? First there was darkness. Then he made what? Light. Night. Then day. One day. Next Day two in the in the Hebrew, night, then day. He does this, night, then day, day three, night. Then it's all in Jewish culture. They don't mark like we do, morning, noon, and night. They say night, morning, noon. That's why Psalm fifty-five says, "I complained and murmured to the Lord." Night, morning, and noon. In other words, that how often do they complain? He says, all the time, all day long. That's a Jewish mindset. We'd say morning, noon, and night, okay? But we count our day different than they do. So they're trying to hurry before the next day starts, the Sabbath, the Shabbat. They've got to get Jesus, because carrying a body is considered work. No work on the Sabbath. They've got to get him into a tomb. Joseph says, I've got my tomb prepared. I'll let him use my tomb. Now, Joseph might have been thinking he's given up his tomb, but it was only a rental. Three days. I mean, it was really... No big deal. He could have had it back. The interesting thing to me is Joseph did not choose to be buried in his own tomb. He still owned it. Joseph was never buried in that tomb after Christ rose. Tomb, that tomb is still empty to this day. In fact, when you go to Israel, they've, they, they've since had to put a big, thick wooden door on it because of vandals. And when they swing, they, they close it at night and, and open it for the tourists to come and look inside. And you can tell it's obviously a, an addition afterwards you know modern day door put on but they open when you open the door they have a verse from mark's gospel what reads he is not here he is what risen just like we do christ is risen he is risen indeed that's right so he is risen you can, you know the funnest part of your faith you can go with me to israel you get all the way over there and and the highlight the the, the climax of the whole trip is going to this empty tomb and you get all the way there and you realize nobody's home. I came halfway around the world to see there's nobody here. But see, this is the point. If he was able to be found, if his body, they just had a, a new Hollywood show about the, the, the centurion that was in charge of looking after his body and, and, they, and he couldn't find it and he interrogated all the people. Where did they put the body? And you know, th- If they could have found Jesus' body... We'd, we wouldn't have Christianity as we do today. But see, they couldn't find it because of this one little detail. Christ truly did rise. And here, John tells us that Mary, she was making her way to the tomb after. Now see, they, they, they have their Shabbat, their Saturday, their Sabbath. She can't go that day. She has to wait till the following day, the first day of the week, that she's going to arrive and she's going to, She's going to come in thinking in the early morn, she comes wondering who's going to roll the stone away. Mark tells us this. She was with, with, with the other Mary, and they're like, who's going to move the stone? We've got to prepare you know, his body properly. We didn't have time. They just wrapped him in a sheet and got him ready. And Well, let me show you this. Nicodemus in John 20, oh, actually, I'm sorry, John 19, the end of John 19, Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by night, he was bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about how many pounds? A hundred pounds worth of spice. What do you do with that spice, by the way? You guys know their, their custom. They wrap the body with linen. They smear the spice over it. Then they put another wrap and smear more spice. And we, we call it like... Um, mummifying right kind of like making the mummy burrito the kids call it a burrito a spice burrito jesus burrito 
They made Jesus, they, 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 it's to prepare the body for burial. They wrap from head to toe with the spices to lay to rest. They light a, 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 an oil candle at the head. Usually it's like, it's all part of their symbolism that the Jews are very, they, they got their rituals to do. But the gals didn't get to do all that on the on that you know day before the the Shabbat, so they were stuck. They're like, we got to wait till the first day of the week after the Sabbath is over. So they get there. It says in verse two of, of John twenty, they ran, and they got there. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I I skipped ahead. I didn't finish chapter nineteen. So they took the Jesus Jesus's body, verse forty bound it in linen wrappings with with the spices as the burial custom of the Jews. Now, the place where he was crucified, where he was crucified, there was a what? A garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. I just want to point out these things I'm telling you about where I got it from the scripture. He's laid in a garden tomb. You say, what's the big deal? I'll show you in a minute. Th this is going to be what we call uh, uh, one of the Jewish... Uh, the Jews, I'm, I'm going to do a study today that is called, uh, the, the Jews like these studies that they, they show shadows and types of, or fulfillments. God bringing about his, when God prophesies he's going to do something, they like to see how it comes about full circle. Like how does God bring it to pass, what he said he's going to do. Okay, this will be a fun one for you today. So they, they here, here they take him to the place, the garden, and therefore, because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was nearby, they laid him there. Now, chapter 20, verse 1. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came early to the tomb while it was still dark. And they saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. They were on the way. Mark tells us they were going, how are we going to get the, the stone out of the way? So she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Who's that, by the way? John, the guy writing the book. He, he, he refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Third person, yeah. And he says, they, the, the Mary came and told him, they've taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they've laid him. And so Peter and the other disciple went forth, and they were going to the tomb. The two of them were running together, and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter, and came to the tomb. Now, if you don't think this is written by real men, <laughs> such humility, only a real man would mention who got to the tomb first. <laughs> you know, there was a race between Peter and myself, and um, I got there first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. John looked in, saw the linen wrappings, but didn't go in. Simon Peter, slow and steady, he gets there. Well, it doesn't say that just then. Simon Peter also came following him, and he entered the tomb and saw the linen wrappings lying there. And the face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had come first to the tomb then also entered. And he saw and believed. For as yet, it says, they did not understand the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. They didn't actually understand it. They just discovered the tomb is empty. And the gal had come to tell him that, you know, hey, we don't, the tomb's empty. We don't know where the body went. And they go to explore to find out what's going on. And by the way, we have this written by a guy who was there. First, first hand account. I want to point this out because some people have called me up in the past and said, hey, did you see the special on them? Um, by the way, never get your theology from the uh, <laughs> television. Some of these channels, they don't ever refer to the book either. They write these shows like there's this credible, we know all the details. We have this new findings. It's called the Shroud of Turin. It's got the 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 face print of Jesus on the on the cloth and it's and he's and, and we've taken it by x-ray image through the thing and you know they send me the image what do you think this is the the wrappings of Jesus and you they got the whole mummy thing you know like with the spice and the whole thing but his face they 
they did the x-ray image through the cloth and you can see the like the blood marks have made a you know like a a face print i mean i don't know what else to call it i mean like a, it's just blood just printed in the in the thing and they're like look we can see his image of jesus and isn't this wonderful and i said wonderfully wrong and what do you mean wonderfully wrong it's not jesus how can you say it looks just like him i said you saw him when did you see him and first of all it's just a print of some blood on the face into the cloth that we're seeing through this image of some kind of special thing and and I got a question for you. Uh, how many of you have seen that picture, by the way, of Shroud of Turin? The, they say this was Jesus' wrapping. So I said, Bull, Loney. Oops. You know why I say that? Because yep. there's a firsthand account witness, two of them, that went into the tomb that day. And they say, right here, the face cloth, verse 7, which had been on his head was not lying with the linen wrappings, but it was rolled up in a place by itself. Let me guess. Afterwards, they went and wrapped the head cloth back into the shape of a head and printed Jesus' face right into the right spot, right? No. Shroud of Turin, Nixay, wrong. as not the wrappings of Jesus. I'm sorry. In fact, I, you know, so, some people say, well, where are they? I've been to the tomb. It's empty. There was no linen wrappings laying around. Obviously, if Jesus wanted us to know about the linen wrappings, he would have, you know, had to make some shrine out of it or something. But, you know, we're weird. We worship weird stuff. As a culture, we, you know, people just want to worship stuff instead of worshiping the risen Savior. Forget worshiping the wrappings i don't worship that by the way i don't go to the tomb and worship the empty tomb i worship you oh empty tomb no i worship the god who could rise someone from the dead and didn't just rise jesus his son but resurrected many of the dead saints and they were seen walking around jerusalem and that's the power of the message we're talking about today we're serving a god who can bring us into everlasting life resurrection not even death can stop what god can do that's what the the proclamation of this message is about that we serve a god that could take care of dead he could raise you from the dead it's no problem for him i mean he created life he stored it off well he took he took adam it says god made the earth and all the things within and he made the garden and he put adam in the garden well actually it says he took from the dust of the ground and formed it in fashioned it into a man and it was just just um dirt we're, we're, by the way do you know chemically what we're for those of you who study chemistry what are we the closest akin to of our chemical composition of this body there's one substance on this planet that we are the closest to kin cousin to, and it's not a chimpanzee. It's dirt. You have the exact chemical composition as dirt. Add water and dirt, and guess what you get? Men. God took the dust of the ground, formed it into a dirt clod, and it was dead still, but it looked like a man. He was called Adam, and then it says he took him and he breathed the breath of what? Life. <sighs> breath in Hebrew is life. Into his nostrils, and Adam became a living soul. Just by the power of God. Now, how many believe God could do that? He went, oh, this is really hard. I can't do dirt clods. I could create a whole universe, hold it in the span of my hand, but I can't make a man. That's really hard, you know. I need monkeys to help me. No. I have no trouble with a God that could create everything we see in six days and sits back on the seventh and says, time to rest. It's good. If he can make everything what we see in six days, how making man was no trouble. But see, this is one of the things I want to point out to you from this story. This is where I love to do. By the way, if you're Jewish, this is for you. Because watch what happens when it says that they saw all the linen wrappings, they, it says they, didn't, they did not understand these scriptures, verse 9, that he must rise again from the dead. So the disciples went away to their own houses. 
But what about Mary? Look at verse 11. But Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and she looked in the tomb. And she saw. Now, she saw this. Interesting to me, Peter and John did not see what she gets to see. What does she get to see? By the way, gals, pay attention. Here's, here's, sometimes gals get to see things that the guys overlook. They saw the linen wrappings with the head cloth over by itself. What does she see? Oh, does she see linen wrapping? Sure, she sees it. What verse 12 says, and she saw two angels in white, one sitting at the head, one at the feet where the body of Jesus had been lying. Any gals would like to get to see two angels? Just, you know, what you, how is your week spiritually going, you know? Oh, I saw two angels. <coughs> and verse 13 says, and they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, because they've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now, when she had said this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Maybe her mascara was, you know, running in the eyes. She didn't pick up who it was. But it tells us what she was thinking. Look at look at verse 15. And it says, and so she, Jesus um, said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, sir, if you carried him away, Tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, one word. What's he say? Mary. Mary. Her name. You know, Jesus says, my sheep, they know my voice. They know my voice. They just, all, all he has to do is say her name. And she turned around, and, and, and she said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which is great teacher. And she latches on to him. And Jesus says to her, stop clinging to me. I have not yet ascended to my father. She's like, you got away from me once, but not this time, buddy. You know, she's just holding on. He says, but go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my father and to your father, to my God and to your God. So Mary Magdalene came announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And, and this is the things he had said to her. She's telling them. Do they all believe her right away? No, it says that in Luke's gospel, she appeared to them as like what she was saying was like nonsense. And by the way, Jesus will show up and rebuke them for their unbelief. And he'll say something really interesting. That they'll, they'll come to believe when they see him risen, but he'll say, blessed are, more blessed are those who will, they don't get to see me. They just hear about this and they believe. Let, in other words, we're the more blessed ones. We just hear this message. We weren't there, but they were there. But on the day this went down, they didn't get it. They didn't understand. You know, this whole resurrection thing was a new deal. You know, you, you're laughing. You're going, oh, of course it's a resurrection. Well, I've, read, I've learned this since I was in, you know, catechism when I was a kid, you know. Or I, I heard this all the time, you know, in, in, in Sunday school when I was little. We learned about, doesn't, don't these guys know about Jesus rising? Guys, this is the day it happened. This is like new thing. Nobody's really gone through it before. Give them a little slack, okay? They don't get it. But when Paul writes the church at Corinth, Paul says something really interesting. He describes Jesus in a way that is really remarkable. He says, let me just read it to you. He says, um, in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, so also is the resurrection from the dead. It is sown in a perishable body. You know, these wearing out type bodies we got. But it's raised in an imperishable body. You know, you plant the seed of a, a little corn and then it dies. And, but it comes up a new stock of what produces 160, you know, many fold just from one little seed. This body goes in as perishable, but it gets raised imperishable. It's sown in dishonor, but it's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness, but it is raised in power. It is sown in a natural body, but it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Y if you ever have someone that's facing death, read them this passage. Just explain to them, don't worry. The body you got now, this one perishes. But God has one that won't. 
It's going to be raised. And put your faith in him because he can do this. Now, so also, verse 45 says, 1 Corinthians 15, 45. So also it is written that the first man, Adam, became a life-giving soul. I just told you about that from Genesis. And the last Adam, the last Adam, wait a minute. Who's the last Adam? Jesus became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from where? From heaven. As is the earthy, so also are those that are earthly. As is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthly, so we also will bear the image of the heavenly. Guys, I got good news for you. You got this earthly body. But God's got to upgrade. You get a heavenly body someday. And Jesus went to all this trouble. Now, he says, I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. How many of you heard that verse from Corinthians? Flesh and blood can't. It, 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 nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of the eye, the last trumpet will sound. And it says, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will all be changed. This perishable must put on imperishable. This mortal must put on immortality. This is a, this is a principle what the scripture has taught since the beginning. That God was going to take these perishable units that we got and upgrade them. In fact, I, I believe that when God made man in the original intent, we, we, well, he didn't have sin. When Adam was made first in the garden with, you know, he, first God made Adam. Then it says he put him to sleep. He took a rib. He fashioned out of, a, out of the rib a, a woman, presented her as a helpmate to him, which I always get in trouble for pointing out. Why, why does Adam need a help? It says there was no helpmate suitable. All the animals. He named all the animals. By the way, even a dog was around. Might be man's best friend, but he wasn't a helpmate suitable. And so God said, let's put you to sleep. Caused a deep sleep to fall over Adam. Took the rib, made it into a woman, presented the woman to the man. Guys, don't get mad at me, but gals, help out here. Why do you, does God make a woman to be a helpmate to the man? What does, the man, what does this insinuate he needs? He needs help. And if you are so proud, men, to not acknowledge that you need help, you are going to miss out on one of the greatest blessings that God has made for you. Because God knows who the right one is to be your helpmate. She has eyes to see things you don't see. She has ways to, to she'll, she'll, she'll be a help to you if you let her. Some guys are like, I don't need any help. I'm like, good luck. They're just blind, by the way. They, they don't see that they need help. But when, when, and by the way, gals, some of the younger ones have been asking me, how do you know who's the right one? I, I'm going to give you a very simple thing. If God created Eve to be the helpmate to Adam, she was made to be, by the way, not everyone's helpmate. How many men is she going to help? One. And that one, she was specifically designed for. And when, girls, when, when you meet the, a fella, and, you've, and you can tell in your heart, that's, like, I could help him. If you go, I don't want to help that guy. I got to, and then you got to come to me for pre-marriage counseling? I'll be like, skip it. <laughs> You're like, why? Look. <coughs> he comes needing help. And if you're going, I ain't going to help him, it just tells me one thing. That's not the right model for you. Because when it's the right model for you, you'll be like, I, I can see he needs help. And I can see who is the right one to help him. When you know it's you, you'll see it. You'll be like, he needs help. He needs not just help. He needs my help. This sh I don't know why people don't pay attention to the design. From the beginning, God made Adam. And he put Eve there with him. In, and, and it says in, in Genesis 2 that God put man there in the garden. 
And he made this helper suitable. This is Genesis 2. I'm just kind of paraphrasing the whole chapter to you today. But after he fashioned Eve and presented her to him, he said, he gave him a commandment. It says they were in the garden together. They were naked. They were both naked. It says at the end of chapter 2, they were not ashamed because there was no sin yet. Okay. By the way, if they went to sin, do you think they would have lived on? Yeah, because it says the wages of sin is death. If they went to Adam, I want to kick him sometimes. Why did you blow it, buddy? Now we had to go through this whole thing. You, you sin, and you guys get, oh, by the way, what happened to them with the whole garden? Li- but Okay, first of all, what was Adam's job? Does anyone know? Who read Genesis? Name the animals, the animal namer. Okay, that's one job, this part of his description. He had another job, was given to him by the Lord, found right here in Genesis. He was to eat from any tree freely. God put him in verse, I'll just so you know where I get this, verse 15 of chapter 2. Then the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. Let's see, cultivate and keeping garden. That pretty much makes you a what? A gardener. Yeah, that's it. Big title for Adam. Adam, here's your title. You are a gardener. Only thing is, I made the garden. It's already planted. All the trees are mature. Oh, and by the way, there was no sin yet. There was says there was no thorns and no thistles. That would come out after they sinned when they get booted from the garden. And there's an angel standing there with a wielding a sword saying, no, go back in the garden because you guys blew it. And when they sinned, it says that when Adam sinned, it says death entered into this world through Adam. And that death, it says, was passed on to all men. Now, Adam, it says, was alive physically, but what had died in Adam? That spirit inside. That sin brought a death to his spirit. And that's why when we read in in the New Testament, when Jesus has this guy, by the way, I find it interesting. The guy Nicodemus that brought the spices to bury Jesus, he was the guy that went to Jesus in John chapter 3 and said, what must I do to have everlasting life? And what was Jesus' answer? You must be what? Born again. He says, what? Am I I supposed to go back into my mother's womb a second time? That's morbid. Jesus goes, whoa, are you a teacher of Israel and you can't? He's not talking of, he said, that which is born of Flesh is flesh, but that which is born of spirit is spirit. You've been born physically. Now you need a spiritual birth. You need to be made alive in your spirit. And death, because Adam was in that garden, he sinned, he gets kicked out. And death now has spread into the whole of the world, all down the line. We all were born with a sinful nature. Physically alive, but spiritually not. And so Paul points out that the first Adam, this first Adam was sent, sown as earthy. But then he said there was this other Adam, the last Adam. Who's he referring to? Jesus, the one that is heavenly. And the last Adam, now this is where I'm going to do the Jewish thing for you. The last Adam, he comes into the world, he doesn't have sin. The first Adam, when he got kicked out of the garden into the world, he had sin. The last Adam came into this world with no sin, yet he took on himself the sins of the world. He dies for the sins of the world. And by the way, where does he get laid? In a tomb, which is in a garden. I wanted to point that out to you. It was in a garden. And when... They checked out that the tomb was empty and the guys went away and she stuck around, Mary. Who did she suppose him to be? The gardener. The last Adam gets mistaken as the gardener. It's just coincidence, you know, full circle. that The last Adam that took all the sin, he came into the world sinless, but went into the garden. Oh, by the way, he goes in dead. Adam, when he was brought to life in the garden and gets kicked out and 
now suffers death. Jesus suffers death, gets put into the garden, and all of this is full circle. He comes out, what? Alive. People are just like, what are you, what's this whole story about? It's about life. The full circle of life where the gardener comes back to show us what life's all about. He came and, and he is the one that the Jews would go, oh, you're a Gentile. You're not supposed to know all this stuff. I'm like, I read your book. I cheated. It's a really good read. I know it's slow. Some of the kids are like, man, I was doing Deuteronomy. Oh, Leviticus. That was a dry read. And they're like, is there really anything in there? I'm like, yeah, there's a lot. But just like any, you got to learn some things. You know, you, you read this book. All of a sudden, you start seeing all these little details. Do you think it's coincidence that she supposed him to be the gardener? No. It's just like all those other scriptures that said what the Messiah would do. So we would, it, by the way, Matthew says Jesus did all these things so that when he fulfilled them, we would know what? Whenever, whenever Matthew, in the, in the Gospel of Matthew, he repeats the same phrase all the time. It, Jesus did this according to the scripture or in order that the scripture might be fulfilled so that you would know that God is what? The Lord. He is the one who's truly the master. He knew it already. We don't serve a God that didn't know what was going to happen. He didn't go, oh, I didn't know. I would have never done. No, he knew. In fact, the Bible tells us Christ was seen as the Lamb of God slain from the what? The foundations of the world. From the get-go, at the beginning. Well, the promise of, of a Redeemer was given as soon as Adam and Eve sinned. God said, all right, woman, you have sinned. You're going to have pain in childbirth because of it. That's your punishment. But just to give you a little hope, through you will come the seed, not multiple seeds, the seed. Who's the seed is he referring to? Jesus, the Savior. The one that will redeem man from their sin. Through, <laughs> through <laughs> I can do that scary. <laughs> it was God? What does he have to say? Christ is risen, right? He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Well, that's the part I wanted to show you today. Christ went full circle to redeem us. He went to, he, he came, and that's, to me, a whole lot less crazy than bunnies laying eggs. <laughs> Especially chocolate-covered ones with little creamy insides and stuff that they come up. I mean, come on. It makes a lot more sense to me what the Scripture teaches, that God wants to take you and make you to have an imperishable body. You, yes, you have this earthly body, but listen, Anyone here can testify that these earthly bodies are wearing out? Can I get an amen? Amen? Isn't it nice to know God's got a plan, which includes an upgrade? This is the part where, you know, if you need, just read 1 Corinthians 15 again tonight, just for a little extra encouragement. This perishable gets to put on what? Imperishable. Anyone game for that? This corruption gets to put on incorruption. And let me make sure I say this right. This mortality <laughs> gets to put on what? Immortality. You get to upgrade. Christ says, if any one of you believes in me, even though you die, you shall what? Live. Let me encourage you this day. If you have not put your faith in Jesus, it's a really simple thing God has s given a gift of his son to the world. He said, anyone who believes in him, anyone, doesn't matter what nationality, what culture, where you're from, what age. Anyone who would believe in him should not perish. But you get what? Everlasting life. If you came to church today and you, you, you never knew that you just need to receive that payment, what Jesus made for you. You just got to say, count me in, Lord. I want, I, want it. I want salvation. Today's a good day for you. I encourage you, just say, Jesus, come into my heart. 
forgive me and and get everlasting life get right with god so that we're get because we're going to be spending eternity together i won't look the same i'm going to be much better looking but you'll you'll you know i hey glorified body here you know i'm gonna upgrade and some of you are going me too right you know, we're gonna we have so such a great hope but the church has forgot to tell people this is what it's about this is our hope. You know what? Peter said, be ready if someone should ask to give an account of the hope that lies within you. What would you tell them if they said, hey, wh why are you Christian? What's your hope in this whole Jesus thing? Yeah, what would you tell them? We have a great hope, don't we? Our hope is we're going to be, once this, once this short span of time, and by the way, we, it is short down here, isn't it? You know, when you think about how long we live compared to eternity, you know, Moses wrote it in Psalm 90. It's, it's like our life is but a vapor, and then we fly away. You know, it's just nothing. It's just such a short amount. And, but we have a hope. And our hope is doesn't end here. We don't die. Oh, that's it. It's done. Black blip. Nirvana. What's so good about nirvana? By the way, that's a, that's a teaching that the devil wants you to believe. That you die and go off into some state of non-consciousness, it just goes black and everything's over. That is not biblical. What about, the, what about that rich man? Did he die and go into a state of non-consciousness? Mm -hmm. No, he went to a place called Hades. It says in which he was in torment and agony. Did he remember this life? Yes. In fact, he, he said, can you, can you let me go back and tell him about I have five brothers? Let me warn him. He said, no, can't. No, can do. Well, if you can't, can you send Lazarus back from the dead? And you know what Abraham told that rich man? He said, listen, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. Because even if one would rise from the dead, what did he say? You said it right there. They would not believe him, would they? You know, if you won't believe what the scripture says, even this story of the resurrection will seem foolish to you. But if you believe what the scripture teaches, the resurrection is the power of God to salvation. And it's awesome. And my, I have no trouble standing up here and tell you, I'd much rather believe that. A lot more credibility in that than the Easter Bunny. Okay? Put your faith in Jesus and have everlasting life. He, he is so worth it. Anyway, that's what I have for you today. Let's, let's stand and sing a closing song and go in the peace of the Lord. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.